morning, everyone. My name is Carolyn Dierbebeck. I'm the director of the Forum on Trade, Environment and SDGs, TESS. Uh, welcome to this session um, of the ISD Trade and Sustainability Hub, um, where we're going to focus on plastic pollution and trade, looking at the WTO, the Basel Convention and a global treaty on plastic pollution. So this session is a joint event co-hosted by the Centre for International Environmental Law and TESS, which is a partnership of the Geneva Graduate Institute and UNEP. So at TESS, our focus is on supporting dialogue and action on trade and trade policies that address global environmental crises and advance implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. Now, a key aspect of our work is trying to facilitate the engagement of stakeholders in discussions at the nexus of trade, uh, environment and sustainable development, especially in the context of the multilateral trading system. And for this reason, we're really delighted to have worked with our colleagues from CL to co-host this event. So CL has been working um, for over 30 years to use the power of law to protect the environment, promote human rights, and ensure a just and sustainable society. Along with other experts and civil society organizations, CL has been working for over a decade on the topic of plastic pollution. And it works at multiple levels, advocating for an international treaty on plastic pollution and for better compliance with the Basel and Stockholm conventions and other measures at the international level. It also works directly with and supports communities um, that are exposing the impacts of plastic on our health, climate and our planet throughout its life cycle. Um, so a few words on context. We're here today in the context of a plastic pollution crisis. Um, plastic pollution occurs across the life cycle of plastics with negative impacts on marine ecosystems, on land, on the climate, as well as on public health and sustainable development. And there's growing recognition of the scale and urgency of this crisis and of the need to tackle the upstream sources of plastic proliferation and toxic pollution alongside efforts to address downstream waste. So in 2021, over 100 countries are calling for a new global agreement to tackle plastic pollution and for a decision on next steps at the UN Environment Assembly in 2022. And alongside, over 190 countries have signed new amendments to the Basel Convention to better regulate trade in plastic waste. In addition, over 60 members have co-sponsored a ministerial statement on plastic pollution, which should be launched soon in the context of the WTO. So we have a great set of panelists today to help us address three questions. The first is how does plastic trade affect communities and the environment? And the second two questions are why are trade policies relevant and how can they support and complement international commitments and evolving efforts to tackle plastic pollution? So we have uh, five speakers, each of whom will speak for seven minutes. And then we should have time for a Q and A. Um, so please do put any questions uh, in the chat and also please feel free to post any materials that you may have that would support um, this discussion and people working on these issues. So we have, uh, I just quickly introduce our speakers. We're going to start with Hamanta Witanage, who is a senior advisor at the Center for Environmental Justice and a chairperson at Friends of the Earth International. We then have Brenda Kukuk, who is the program, who is a program manager at UN Environment Program, where she works on issues of plastics and also chemicals. Then we have Maria Daniela Garcia Freire, who is the deputy permanent representative at the Permanent Mission of Ecuador to the WTO, followed by Andres del Castillo, who is the senior attorney at the Center for International Environmental Law. And finally, Valentina Sierra, who is the secretary at the permanent mission of Uruguay to the United Nations here in Geneva. So to try and keep us on track today, I have my small bell that I will ring at six minutes so everyone knows where they are on time. And then without further ado, I'd like to welcome Hemanta, please, to share with us your experience as someone who is working on the ground uh, with communities and civil society organizations on issues of plastics and trade. Hemanta, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Caroline. Um, I'm happy to be in this panel uh, with distinguished panelists. Uh, and I'm uh, Hema Tritanagi from Sri Lanka. And currently, I'm the chairperson of the Friends of Youth International. Uh, we have a few uh, issues, few experiences in Sri Lanka. Can we go to the next slide? Um, 
as we know that Asia is uh, subjected to a lot of uh, plastic pollution and China produced the largest quantity and also followed by United States and Germany um, and some other countries. And, and as we all know that beverage um, and pack, packing, packaging industry is the dominant uh, single use plastic users and it's about 42% entering the use space. And, um, in, in, in our countries, in our part, we have done a lot of brand audits and we found, uh, and, and with the support of the Bakery from Plastic um, and IPEN and Gaia and all these different networks, and we found Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola, Unilever, so they are some top companies responsible. Um, and also Asia has become a dumping ground, especially uh, when China decided not to get any kind of plastics. I think uh, it has increased uh, uh, heavily. Um, and, and also uh, uh, for the plast ocean pollution, I think uh, Asia is very much responsible. Um, and during the pandemic, we have found that the, the, the plastic pollution has increased again because of the, uh, the, the plastic packaging and also uh, mask and uh, another. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm going to share two uh, case studies from Sri Lanka. And, and as we know that many of, of the Southeast Asian countries are suffering from uh, plastic dumping. Um, and I'm from South Asia and Sri Lanka also have had these kind of stories and Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia and Thailand and our colleagues are fighting to send some of those plastics back. Um, in 2019, Center for Environmental Justice, my organization, we filed the case against 263 containers of uh, plastic and post-consumer waste. In one of the container, they have mentioned that it is post-consumer waste uh, categorized under the Basel Convention. Uh, it was waste carpets and a lot of plastics were inside and they, they have come brought to Sri Lanka for some value adding um, and, and they say they can increase, the, they can add the value about 10% and can uh, sell it to somewhere else, uh, but it is, they are good for scrapping and, and they cannot use it again. Uh, because they are some sort of a hospital waste uh, was here. And so we filed this, uh, the legal action against the government authorities and also the, the companies involved. The, the fortunately, Court of Appeal um, uh, gave the order uh, in, in support of us and they asked to, to return all these uh, 260 containers back to the United Kingdom and, and uh, almost uh, two thirds of the containers now back in UK, uh, but there we found that another 40 containers still in Sri Lanka and we are going to bring back this uh, case uh, uh, again to the court. Next slide, please. I'm sure everyone heard about the Express Pearl incident, which is one of the, the, the dangerous um, chemical ship accident. I think if not the only uh, the chemical ship accident, it had uh, 81 uh, containers with hazardous uh, toxic material, but it also had about 1,680 metric tons of uh, uh, plastic noodles and 9,700 metric tons of epoxy resin, and all of them spilled into the water. Um, and uh, according to our calculation, at least we are talking about 85 billion plastic noodles, and they are burned and they, they have converted into the small microplastic pellets, and they are all over in Sri Lanka, about 700 kilometers long, uh, long coastline, about 20,000 fishermen are affected. And according to the government, only 40% of the plastics we were able to collect, uh, but rest of the plastics now, uh, some of them are in the beaches, uh, still there are plastics noodles in the ocean, and also some washed away from Sri Lanka. And uh, according to the modeling, it may have already reached Malaysia, Indonesia, um, at the same time, other side, the Indian coast already. Uh, so, uh, so we are here talking about trillions of microplastics. And recently, there's a proposal came from the government of Sri Lanka to the IMO to uh, to consider this, uh, the, declare this as a hazardous material. But it's still, um, we didn't see a um, lot of positive approach from the uh, from the uh, IMO. Um, and here we have the ITOF International Tank Owners Pollution Federation, and also the PNI Club, which is the insurer. They are not happy about uh, showing these uh, microplastics. In fact, we have many other stories behind this one. So, but unfortunately, the Sri Lankan coast is very much affected by plastic noodles and, and, and uh, epoxy resins. Next slide, please. 
Yes, um, and in, in, in both cases, we have plenty of other cases I can share, but in these cases, we can show that the businesses are involving human rights violations, they are not taking the responsibility for all these dumping of plastics, and their life, life cycle is on, on human health, and, and the food security is in danger, environment in danger, and also they are violating the fundamental rights. Um, and the plastic waste we see as a form of a waste colonialism, is an environmental injustice, is a viola violation of human rights and violation of international instruments we have. And we already found that they are not in line with the Basel Convention, and, and we really need to have the uh, to uh, to have the Basel Convention, uh, the the amendments immediately uh, to to um, uh, to uh, implement. Um, and also, uh, this shows that you need a mandatory global treaty to control transboundary movement of plastic waste. Um, and with respect to the human rights, we call the strong binding instrument on multinational enterprises and need need of the law, um, the national level to implement the same. Um, I think that's my last slide. Um, thank you so much, uh, Caroline, for giving this opportunity. I'm, I'm happy to speak, um, give answer if you have any questions. Great, thank you so much, Herman Satmore. Thank you for um, participating in our discussion today. I think your presentation has really highlighted how important it is um, to have organizations working on the ground uh, be heard um, in international discussions on these issues because you can bring um, this direct evidence and, and, and help people understand what is happening on the ground, especially in the international fora where it ends up often being quite abstract. Um, so this is really vital. And it was also interesting, I think, to hear um, how much you rely on and use these legal mechanisms, both nationally and internationally, to try uh, to address these issues and, and therefore how important it is that we implement um, the provisions that are there. Just a, a fact that I didn't bring up um, in the beginning, which I should have, is just to note for those who are not aware that with UNCTAD, we conducted a study um, last year that shows that there is at least um, a, a trillion dollars worth of trade each year um, in plastics across the life cycle of plastics. Um, a major part of that is trade in primary plastics, the kinds of nurdles that Hemanta was um, talking about. And um, our estimate is that at least 60% of primary plastics that are produced internationally are traded across borders, which means that they are put in ships and moved around the world. So um, the challenge of loss at sea um, across uh, uh, um, uh, of, of plastics at sea is really a critical part of this piece of the plastics trade um, issue and, and really does uh, warrant attention. So with that, I'm gonna turn to Brenda Kokak, who is the, um, from UNEP and she's going to give us an overview of what UNEP is doing um, in this space and the various pieces of the puzzle and, and where, we can, where we can move those forward. Brenda, you have the floor. Great, thank you very much, Carolyn. And uh, uh, it's a pleasure to follow such a concrete uh, presentation in terms of real action on the ground. And uh, I'll be looking more from the global perspective uh, in terms of, of UNEP. Um, as you are really aware and you've already highlighted, we are seeing a real momentum build for dealing with plastic pollution globally over these past months, particularly following the ministerial conference that was held at the World Trade Organization in Geneva uh, in September and supported by, by UNEP, but really led by uh, four governments, uh, Germany, Ecuador, uh, Ghana, and Vietnam. Um, the issue of plastic pollution has really come forward to UNEP and our Environment Assembly, our governing body, through numerous UNEA resolutions um, since 2014, and have used many terms linked to the marine environment, such as marine plastic debris and microplastics at UNEA 1 back in 2014, to marine litter and microplastics at UNEA 4. But so liberations today are really clearly uh, linked, looking across the life cycle. So from extraction and convergence, uh, conversion to manufacturing and use to end of life. And the issue is embedded in the triple planetary crisis of pollution, climate, and nature. Pollution in the world's plastic pollution in the world's oceans alone costs the global economy up to $2.2 trillion per year. And it has direct impacts on a range of economic sectors from fisheries and agriculture to tourism onwards. 
Greenhouse gas emissions across the life cycle are projected to grow uh, to 19% of the global carbon budget by 2040 and inhaled from air, ingested in food and water and absorbed through the skin, uh, microplastics have been found in various human organs. So we need to drive solutions to rethink how we make and use and dispose of plastics and take into account the full life cycle of plastic products. So I thought I would start briefly with waste, an area that we're all faced with on a daily basis in terms of plastics. So less than 10% of plastics are recycled globally, putting pressure on developing countries to become dumping grounds for richer countries. And in this regard, we see uh, the Basel Convention controlling transboundary movements of hazardous waste and disposal as a key tool to supporting waste management of plastics. And this is, of course, a UNEP administered convention. It has three main pillars with regard to waste, the control of transboundary movement, environmentally sound management, and prevention and minimization. The plastic waste amendments were adopted by the Conference of the Parties and, and since of, of the Basel Convention. And, and since January 2021 of this year, then the amendments have been effective uh, for 188 parties. Furthermore, the Basel has a plastic waste partnership and it's providing a multi-stakeholder forum to address plastic waste on several fronts, um, such as strengthening policy and legal frameworks and developing solutions for environmentally sound management of plastic waste, stimulating innovations uh, to increase durability, reusability, repairability, and recyclability. The second segment of the COP, uh, the Basel Convention COP will be held face-to-face um, in Geneva in June 2022, and this is kind of one of the next milestones we're looking towards. But beyond waste, you know, we are seeing many other challenges, such as the elimination of single-use and disposable plastic products, ensuring plastic products are free of hazardous chemicals, health, safety, and rights of people are respected, reuse, repair, and the recycling of plastic products at the end of their life, sustainable alternatives, and scaling up finance to enable the transition to a plastics pollution-free economy. Trade has links to all of these, and, um, and it's a very important linkage for us at UNEP. Um, at UNEP, we're building on efforts of the Global Partnership of Marine Litter as a key tool uh, to, to work on this issue, including through our digital platform for sharing information. We're working with front runners to commit to action on progress through the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and UNEP's new Plastic Economy Global Commitment which captures 20% of the global packaging industry. A progress report was developed um, by, uh, by this commitment and was released in November. It reports that virgin plastic use has peaked for the signatories of this commitment and is now on a downward trend. So we're seeing some positive things in some of our efforts, but we wanna see more efforts towards single use packaging, chemicals, et cetera, and moving forward. There's also the Clean Seas campaign uh, that we're working through for outreach and advocacy. Uh, supporting at national level on um, action and planning and implementation and enabling. And we have further specific agreements administered by SICAM that are addressing chemicals such as the Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants, as well as, as the Strategic Approach to International uh, Chemicals Management, SICAM. So in terms of environment and trade, you know, it's very unfortunate that the WTO Minister Merit's Ministerial Conference is postponed. Um, nevertheless, we hope you can really build on this momentum for adopting a ministerial statement on plastics pollution and environmentally sustainable plastics trade. Um, we're also encouraged by the other statements on sustainability and fossil fuels, uh, but we really see the statement on plastics uh, encouraging the exploration of ways that trade can be part of the solution to plastics problem. And we welcome this and we, we look forward to working with you and moving forward on this. We really feel that together, you know, we are a lot stronger if we can join hands to promote a circular economy. So UNEA 5.2 will take place uh, from the February 28th uh, to 2nd of March uh, 2022. And momentum has grown, starting with the closure of the ad hoc open-ended working uh, expert group on marine litter and microplastics in November 2020, to the entry into the force of the Basel Plastic Waste Amendments in January, to the ministerial conference held in September at WTO. Um, as Carolyn mentioned, we're now hearing support for an intergovernmental negotiating committee from many countries. And two resolutions are under consideration at the moment in our environmental assembly process. One from Rwanda and Peru that's been co-sponsored by a number of countries 
and a working paper from Japan uh, that has also been brought forward, but not um, a, a draft resolution at this stage. But both of these proposals, it's clear, refer to the establishment of an intergovernmental negotiating committee to launch negotiations of a global agreement at UNEA, uh, at UNEA 5.2, and both highlight the need for a whole life cycle approach. So we see UNEA as a potential turning point for action on plastic pollution, and we want to continue to proactively advance in the lead up and in moving forward. Um, if member states do launch an INC, we want to see a possible future global agreement that has impact. And to do so, we need to protect the people and the planet by eliminating plastic pollution in all parts of the environment, including the marine environment. But we also need to move the plastics economy to a pollution-free circular economy, minimizing the generation of waste, greenhouse gases, and other emissions associated with the plastics value chain, and consider alternatives. So in closing, I just want to say we're at a pivotal moment. We have a short window now leading up to UNEA 5.2, and we're happy to see all of you building into the momentum. We at UNEP, of course, as our core mandate, are committed to protect the planet from plastic pollution. Efforts at WTO are helping to advance the global efforts, and we're very grateful. At national level, we'd encourage trade ministries, civil society, to work together with environment ministries across the board to move the plastics economy to a circular economy. And we really feel we can drive, work together to drive ambition and impact and that together we're stronger. So I'll leave it on that note. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Brenda, for that really great overview of the range of different ways that, um, that UNEP is approaching this issue. Um, and also it was really um, useful to hear ac across the various processes um, that you mentioned that there's sort of this move towards a focus on the life cycle of plastics and pollution across the life cycle. So in Basel and UNEA discussions, and also um, that's also the case in the WTO process. Um, and I also uh, really appreciated um, this emphasis that in order to, to uh, make progress here, we really need to shift the plastics economy. And that will take um, a focus on, on how we achieve that transition as well. So with that in mind, I wanted to now introduce um, Daniela from the Permanent Mission of Ecuador um, to introduce a little about um, the process at the WTO and also how it relates to the UNEA process that I know that um, Ecuador is also a leader um, in supporting. Daniela, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Caroline. Uh, thank you to the uh, IISD and um, congratulations for the excellent presentations, uh, Brenda and Jimenta. Um, I'm very glad to be here, even if the MC12 was postponed, uh, we keep working and we remain pragmatic and, and relevant. Uh, this is such an important issue and we need to keep working. So I'm glad to introduce the WTO uh, informal dialogue on plastic pollution and trade and how it relates to, to UNEA, how uh, trade can contribute to, to, to this process. So just uh, first to, to, to start with this, um, with uh, what I wanted to share, why Ecuador is here. Um, so, well, Ecuador, uh, same as uh, other countries, uh, had uh, let alone uh, had had led uh, the fight against plastic pollution. But then not only countries, the stakeholders, civil society. I mean, uh, we are uh, quite uh, different uh, and uh, various uh, and a lot uh, of actors uh, in this uh, in this area uh, that have promoted uh, for more than a decade in several international forums uh, the how to how we find solutions to fight plastic pollutions from the inclusion of a reference in the Rio declaration or work with developing countries so that uh, this aspect was included in the 2030 agenda and uh, the work conducive to the adoption of the Basel Amendments, and we're currently, currently taking part in two processes. Uh, in September, as Brenda already mentioned, we sponsored a ministerial meeting uh, with Germany, Ghana, uh, and Vietnam in Geneva. Uh, now uh, we are co-sponsors as well uh, of a resolution uh, that was uh, launched by uh, Rwanda and Peru for the adoption of a mandate for negotiating a new global agreement on marine plastic pollution uh, in UNEA 2.5 on plastic pollution. Uh, and uh, Ecuador is a very proud coordinator together with Australia, Barbados, China, Fiji, and Morocco of the informal dialogue on plastic pollution and trade, the IDP. 
The dialogue started with China and Fiji and today brings together 67 members from all regions. I'm very happy to say this because we started like really uh, in a very small group and now we are 67 uh, with very ambitious goals. Um, and we are all from different regions and uh, different levels uh, of development as well. Uh, we were able to present the IDP thanks to Australia at UNEP ministerial meeting in September. And we're really happy that the IDP uh, and uh, same the TSSD, uh, another initiative uh, we are part of in the WTO, uh, have been innovative in bringing the participation of multiple stakeholders in our discussions. This is new in the WTO, and uh, this is great because we have uh, benefited a lot of the expertise and the participation of UNEP, uh, BRS Secretariat, TESS, um, Caroline uh, has been amazing always, um, uh, WWF, uh, the World Economic Forum, and uh, to this date we have received the contribution of 15 stakeholders. Now, uh, today, the IDP has a ministerial declaration endorsed by, uh, I already mentioned, 67 members, and we hope uh, to bring more to the table. So how does trade contribute to the NEA process on plastic pollution? Uh, we need definitely uh, Ecuador and uh, 153 countries have been vocal in saying we need a binding instrument. We need a comprehensive framework to uh, cover plastic pollution and to ensure a coordinated international uh, coordinated international action, share responsibility and a common approach to deal with this global problematic. The challenge is how to organize these global responses, how to encourage the participation of all, uh, of, all, of, of, all of all the actors that are part of the, the discussion that have something to propose, uh, suggest and do. And certainly we need further commitment and actions across the life cycle of plastics. And that's something that we have in common with uh, same Basel, UNEP, WTO, we're all on the same page. Uh, in the WTO, uh, discussions around plastics have intensified over the last years. And one indicator is that we see members that, have in, that are increasingly using trade uh, policies to address plastic pollution as a solution. Uh, plastic, we need to change the narrative, plastic, uh, trade is not um, the problem, uh, it can be the solution as well. From the WTO databases, for example, we have um, now uh, seen that uh, these last four years, uh, there is an accelerated uh, implementation of measures being adopted mostly by LDCs and developing countries. Uh, discussions in our committees have also in, ident, uh, intensified, and the IDP has definitely been, uh, in the words of um, the DG program, a game changer over the last year, and it has helped to boost and focus uh, the discussion even much, even even more. Uh, the IDP, we believe, it gives us a platform when we can have a better understanding on how trade policy and the fight against, against plastic pollution interact. Uh, as I was saying, we need to change the narrative from being part of the problem to being part of the solution. I think all of the 60, 70 members that are part of the IDP are uh, in the same direction. And we can see, for instance, uh, just to go to factual information, uh, that most of the measures affecting plastics uh, are technical requirements. In the case, uh, when we talk about trade and the WTO, import licenses, regulatory restrictions, in some case, we found, um, for example, tax schemes designed to penalize uh, hard to recycle plastics or incentivize alternatives. There are several uh, policies also uh, designed to reduce harmful and unnecessary plastics. This is part also of our discussions in the IDP. And uh, what we need, uh, our roadmap now, uh, we need to, to, to have an improved uh, understanding of the type of intervention that could be considered from trade policies to support the transition to a more circular economy as well as, as, as Brenda already mentioned, uh, this is a very important part uh, of the solution. Uh, to note uh, also, and, uh, and I'm very happy to see is that, to, to say this is that uh, if there's one issue in the WTO where developed and developing countries we have a clear and common goal is plastics. The conversation, uh, this conversation really represents a bridge building, building uh, a bridge building issue between developing and developed economies. Uh, we can say we have a common goal and we go beyond uh, this conversation uh, on development. 
Uh, most of the trade measures, I already mentioned these, um, uh, are implemented. Uh, that have been implemented from what we see in the databases to tackle plastic pollution uh, come from developing countries and in particular LDCs. And this is uh, very important uh, because LDCs and developing countries, they see trade policy as part of the discussion and as part of the solution. And the IDP has gathered the support of develop, developing LDC members with particular attention of small island developing states. Uh, and this is very important because uh, we have diverse members in the process and one immediate action that we need to, 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 to implement is how we can secure an active participation of these countries, LDCs and small island developing states in the discussions, both in UNEA and also in the IDP in Basel and, and, and this is instrumental. Um, now, um, good news as well, we were talking last year about how we can have more members from uh, participating in UNIA in the IDP and more members in the IDP and UNIA. I think this is, um, now we have members, uh, we, we have a lot of members participating in both processes. And we still need to encourage more uh, that have not done this yet from the IDP. We, we are stronger uh, together and we're definitely part of this uh, more global a um, solution or, or, or way to, to be uh, uh, discussed at UNEA. Uh, and um, just to, 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 to finish, uh, and I would like to go to the ministerial statement. Um, so we already mentioned uh, during past conversation that we had a written statement uh, that reflects the balance of the broad debate, uh, debates that we had in different six, uh, in six aspects improving transparency and monitoring trade, uh, trade trends. Uh, Caroline already mentioned 5% um, of the trade uh, globally relates to plastics. Uh, and this is a very, a very important issue when, we, when, when some uh, could say like trade is not part of, 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 of this. Well, 5% of the trade relates to plastics. Promoting best practices, strengthening policy coherence, identifying the scope for collective approaches assessing capacity and technical assistance needs and cooperating with other international processes and efforts. Uh, just going uh, to uh, UNEA or a statement acknowledges the many international, regional and domestic efforts, decision and processes uh, at addressing plastic pollution uh, in other fora, including Basel, the Basel Convention and uh, the discussions in the context of uh, the of uh, the United Nations Environmental Assembly, including the discussions uh, towards a binding instrument. And this is a very important uh, thing that is included, is included in our statement. Uh, we definitely highlight the, the, the opportunities for enhanced cooperation among these different, um, but complementarity, a uh, complementary uh, processes towards a common vision, taking into account the importance to ensure, um, to avoid duplication and to, to ensure a collective uh, response. Um, also through our statement, we emphasize the importance of continue to engage and support actions in processes, including uh, in the conversation, including enhancing cooperations with, cooperation with international organizations in areas such as, but not limited to definitions, scopes, scope standards design and labeling for plastics, including plas uh, plastic packaging and capacity building that would promote uh, a more uh, circu a circular economy, including through relevant, relevant international processes. And this is where we have the ongoing discussions towards a new global instrument on plastics, Adunia 5.2 uh, as well, and also how to better implement the Basel Convention. Um, one in very important action we aim to, to discuss about next year is also how to improve gathering of data, how to work with the World Customs Organization um, by utilizing the HS system, HS convention. So this is uh, one of the things. There is much more in our declaration. We have a clear roadmap, but definitely there's um, much more to do, much more to, uh, we need to, uh, we need to, as I mentioned, um, and Brenda made it uh, clear, we are stronger um, together. And uh, we need to, to, to work on an ambitious outcome 
and uh, definitely how trade can contribute uh, to the UNIA process is one of the things taking into consideration uh, UNIA 5.2 is happening in February. So um, thank you, Carolyn. Sorry, I think I went beyond my seven minutes, um, but happy to receive any question about the statement as well, which we are very happy to still have. We still have a ministerial statement, even without MC12. So <laughs> um, that's great news as well. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Daniela. And really amazing news to have 67 co-sponsors um, of that statement. I think it's also worth noting that um, there are many countries who participate in the work of the IDP because it's open to all members. Um, so there are many others who participate who may not necessarily have co-sponsored, but who follow the work and have expressed an interest in it. So I would personally expect that engagement um, of countries to, to evolve and probably to grow uh, over time. Um, one thing I really appreciated uh, in your remarks is your emphasis on this effort to link the two processes, that there are many pieces of the puzzle of how we're going to tackle plastic pollution. It will involve a range of different actors from across the UN system and a range of different processes. And I think what's really vital is that we um, have delegates like yours and countries like yours that are doing the work to, to, to connect the dots um, between those processes, which also means doing work at home at the national level in terms of linking you know, environment ministries and trade ministries um, together. Um, hopefully in the question and answer, we can come back to a few more of the specifics of what are in the statement, because I think there are some, um, I might just quickly um, mention too, that one of the areas that the members have committed to working is to identify best practices on how trade related uh, cooperation can help promote trade um, in goods and services that can help reduce plastic pollution. This could include um, environmentally sound waste management technologies, for instance, or plastic substitutes, um, and also um, cooperation on reducing unnecessary and harmful plastics and plastic products. Um, and they've mentioned in particular single use plastic, um, plastics and plastic packaging that's associated with international trade. So I think there's some really concrete areas that members have, um, have outlined, which are worth, um, uh, you know, which are really commendable in that statement. So without further ado, I'd like to turn now to Andres um, from Cial um, to talk a little bit about Cial's perspective on these issues and about the potential for trade provisions in MEAs. Um, Andres, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Caroline. And I have a presentation that uh, probably you can already see on your screen. And I will uh, focus on the, the role of trade-related measures within the potential new treaty on plastics. But before of that, I, as a co-convener of this event, I would like to thank the panelists, the participants and organizers uh, of this very important and unique dedicated session on the issue of plastic and trade. And also kudos to Eleonore from Ciel who have been gathering all together to be here with you sharing uh, some important views. Um, so as you can see first in the first uh, slide of the picture, in your screen is the United Nations Charter Preamble. And if we were updating the first sentence to the currently context, we propose the current language. We, the people of the world who consume a credit card's worth of plastic every week and after the world war, I will include also and mention the three planet, uh, interplanetary crises, climate change, biodiversity loss and pollution. Uh, and of course the plastic crisis, which is intrinsically linked with fossil fuels and a cross-cutting issue. Next slide, please. Thank you. As you might know, plastics, uh, or 99% of plastic is made from chemical source from uh, fossil fuels. Here in the graphic, you will see the process and products from exploration, cracking, polymerization, and products of what we know as plastics, such as uh, synthetic fibers too, synthetic rubber, coating sovels, and others. And uh, it's worth to say too that uh, according to the last report of the UN group of experts on scientific aspect of marine environment protection, called, uh, known as uh, USAMPs, offshore oil and gas contribute to total marine plastic pollutions. Uh, since there is an evidence that the use of microplastic in the activities could be substantial. So even for the exploration and exploitation of oil offshore, you need and you, the, uh, the industry using microplastics. And uh, there is only at the legal framework, one convention that is the OSPAR convention that is recurring 
actually a disclosure on the content of microplastics in the chemical composition of products that we use, that they, not, not we, uh, the oil and gas industry use for offshore exploration and exploitation activities. Uh, next slide, please. So here you will see a graphic that, uh, that uh, I took from a uh, in-deep review or uh, scientific analysis of more than 10,000 relevant substances that are used in plastic production. And uh, the uh, outcomes of the, of the review or of the study show that more than 2,400 substances are identified, identified as substance of potential concern. Um, and many of, this, some of those substances, around 1,300, uh, 1, are substances that are not adequately regulated in many parts of the world. And even some of those substances, more than uh, around 1,000, are approved in, for use in food contact plastic in some jurisdictions. So we need to do something on that. There is a lack of transparency regarding substance present in plastic too. And uh, this is not always, this is not about components and additives, but also non-intentionally added substance that is difficult sometimes to identify. Uh, we consider that this should be addressed in a global treaty with, of course, trade-related measures. But first, let talk, uh, let's take a, a step uh, backwards. Next slide, please. Um, here is um, kind of the picture of some of the current international framework related to marine litter and other topics uh, on pollution, biodiversity, and chemicals and waste. And we see uh, and there is a conclusion from a UNEP document uh, that is a, we call the assessment document from 2017. Uh, it says that finally the framework is fragmented and is not uh, adequately addressed marine litter and microplastics at the time. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So there's a few reflections that we want to, to, to make on this question of trade and plastic crisis. The first is plastic is a common concern of, uh, the plastic crisis is a common concern of humankind. Uh, the crisis is transboundary of, and of global in scope. And there is some critical, as has been said by the pre uh, president uh, panelist, uh, angle of the trade and international trade because plastic represents an important portion of product trading internationally, not only on volume, but also on, on value, as had said before. Then trade measures are useful only to the extent that they support the problem, but not all the issues related to the plastic crisis require specific trade measures. The problems are also environmental, climate, social and human rights, and there is a human rights dimension, of course, as Hemanta said in his presentation at the beginning. A legally binding agreement will require also trade-related provisions within the agreement itself, which can include trade controls and restrictions. Next slide, please. So what do we know about trade-related measures with other multilateral environmental agreements or MIES? We know, according to the WTO matrix uh, that you will find in the, in the after, in the, in, we're gonna share with you this presentation you, when you have the EPR links and look at this specific tool, say that uh, around uh, 20 uh, multilateral environmental agreements include provision on, on trade or trade-related measures that the use of trade related measures with the, with the uh, multilateral agreements might be the most effective way to ensure that environmental objectives are achieved. That the trade related measures sometimes raise questions regarding their compatibility with international trade law. But here the question is not whether a multilateral environmental agreement could itself conflict with international trade law, but rather whether a party implementation of this agreement could be in conflict with obligation under international trade law. That is, is quite different. Uh, next slide, please. So here there is a compilation of a range of proposals of, as we know, features that can be included uh, into the plastic treaty. And there are three documents that uh, I, will, I will just give an overview. The first one is the UNEP assessment from 2017. 
take into account that this assembly was released before the adoption of the three plastic amendments of the Basel uh, Convention. Then we're going to talk about the ministerial statement of, uh, that was uh, discussed in early September and has been uh, endorsed for more, which for more than seven, uh, 70 countries so far. And of course, the Rwanda draft uh, Rwanda Peru draft resolution. So under the UNEP assessment, you can see how they call for a priority binding control measures that includes self-determined national reduction targets, including reduction in production and consumption, cooperate to determine uh, uh, global standards for the environmental controls that also includes minimal quality standards. And here they, um, the, the report call for uh, to make sure that those standards um, will guide the states in achieving their targets in compliance with WTO regulations is worth to say that too. Then uh, it's really important that within an agreement is uh, the question of national inventories to address domestic production and consumption, uh, include also additive and other chemicals used in the production and treatment of plastic. And here I, 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 I do a little pause to, to say when we talk about production consumption, consumption is not individual consumers and consumption, but try to think more on the definition on the Montreal protocol that's, uh, that defines consumption as the production plus the imports uh, minus the export of the controlled substances. So here, looks, look, let's look at the production consumption under those, uh, those definitions of the Montreal Protocol. Then a global labeling scheme certified by a central authority and on international trade, there are specific measures. Some of those measures had already been integrated in the three uh, plastic Basel amendments uh, with important export controls with, uh, with regulation of plastic protocol concerned in specific areas such as small island developing states, and then on the compliance measures, apart from the monitoring, there is a mandatory reporting that will need to include consumption from domestic and import resources, production patterns for domestic and export purposes, waste management procedures, non-hazardous plastic waste imported and exported, additives produced, traded and treated. Then on the ministerial statement, we also see some of the mentions to trade that can be and might be addressed with a plastic treaty that includes sustainable alternative aiming to circularity, reduction, and this is really, really important of virgin plastic production because this language was agreed already under this ministerial statement uh, outcome or document. Uh, then preventive measures related to design, to fostering reduction, recyclability, repairability, and finally recyclability. Then apart from preventive measure, we will need specific measures for plastics and it's an additive, which present particular risk uh, to the environment and human health, particularly for children and women. And then we need to do something with the difficult to collect and manage safely products. And there will be some means, some implementation for supporting developing countries like technological support, and here I put the accent that all the trade related measures need to be complemented with other measures and provisions such as incremental cost provision for those countries where it's difficult to, to act. So um, I hear the, 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 the belt and I will forward to the random period resolution that also includes some, some specific topics that need to be included and or addressed during the negotiation of the plastic treaty. And uh, next slide, please. Then we, uh, as CL and other partners, we release a, a document that we're going to share too about what are the potential pillars of the next uh, of the new trade agreement. Next, next slide, please. And uh, here you will be highlight some of the need to trade related measures that need to be included concerning microplastic labeling on agriculture too, on policy and legislation, etc. Uh, and next slide, please. Then there is a possible governance and structure that has been developed by different uh, stakeholders and governments and organizations that I will, I will also suggest you to have a read because some of those suggest some trade related provisions. And next slide, please. Then other resources uh, that uh, we comply for you on the treaty, on the content of the treaty. Next slide, please. 
then some database that are useful on trade and environment for you to, to have a look at. And uh, thank you for that. Next slide. Thank you so much, Caroline. Back to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Andres. And I wish we had had another 10 minutes because I think um, that's the first time I've seen someone really go through uh, the UNEA proposal, or at least CL's kind of vision of how the treaty could look, and really to make the links between some of the areas and where trade policies um, are relevant. So um, I'm really heartened, in fact, that you know this discussion of trade um, and plastics is, is spurring that kind of reflection, a really detailed reflection on, on where and how we can address these systems through different international uh, processes. So thank you so much for that. I will turn swiftly now to Valentina, uh, from the permanent mission of Uruguay um, to give us your reflections. You have the floor, Valentina. Thank you very much, Caroline. Uh, I would like to start by thanking Ciel and Tess for the invitation uh, to participate in this panel today. Uh, and all the panelists that are present here, uh, it, this is a good example of how we should move forward uh, by interacting uh, with diverse stakeholders and areas of work to avoid duplication of efforts and, and to avoid working in silos, uh, to address plastic pollution, which represent one of the major, uh, the major environmental threats to our planet. Oh, Scientific evidence has shown that plastic litter presents risk both uh, to human health and for the environment. It negatively impacts on human rights, on climate change, on biodiversity, uh, the oceans, marine ecosystems, food safety and food chains, coastal communities and their livelihoods, among others. And as you previously uh, hear when I was presented, uh, introduced, I work for the permanent mission of Uruguay to the UN, um, and I follow uh, all environmental, <clears throat> environmental area. I'm sorry for that, I'm a bit sick. Um, among which I represent RULAC uh, on the Bureau of the Basque Convention. And regarding that, in, in 2019, the Basel Convention, COP14, adopted two relevant decisions uh, to address plastic waste crisis. One was the Plastic Waste Amendment, which was, was previously uh, introduced. Uh, this, these amendments include plastic waste in this binding agreement uh, that makes global trade more transparent, uh, better regulated, and safer. And the other one was the Plastic Waste Partnership that was established to mobilize and mobilize diverse uh, stakeholders, resources, and expertise to provide assistance and practical support. But here I want to highlight that this COP was a, a very special one, mainly um, because it was very surprising how the Plastic Waste Amendment were adopted uh, so fast and, and by acclamation, by consensus, of course. Uh, and that's that not that not happen uh, every time in other other decisions could could take years to be adopted to be revised to be negotiated but in this case we had we really feel that there was a momentum that was pushed by by the media by by the the civil society uh, by many by, by the youth there was um, a real momentum and a real uh, feeling of ownership uh, on this matter. And that was why uh, we could adopt this, uh, this decision so quickly. Um, so I hope this momentum, um, we see this momentum again, this momentum is repeated on UNEA uh, 5.2, uh, is needed uh, to adopt uh, the decision to start in the negotiations of a, a new agreement on plastic waste. But certainly uh, this treaty, the, the Basel Convention, has more potential and, and further work could be explored to expand its mandate. But for the moment, it's our responsibility uh, as parties to identify the existing challenges to fully implement the plastic waste amendments and to give support to developing countries uh, through cooperation, capacity building, technical assistance and financing. Uh, we would also like to thank the government of Ecuador. Uh, thank you. Uh, personally, I, I would like to thank Daniela because she was the one to introduce me to this, uh, this world on the WTO and, and all the work you were doing, you are doing. Uh, and thank you also for leading this informal dialogue on plastic uh, and environmentally sustainable plastic trade, uh, which Uruguay recently joined. Uh, it was also a very good, um, a very good work that we, 
we we did it um, jointly with our mission to WTO because we have two separate missions and it was a very good experience also to work together and to address the environmental area and the trade area together um, also well I, I would like also to highlight the importance of, of this initiative the IDP uh, and it, it's exploratory and synergistic nature uh, with other multilateral discussions and forums as BRS Secretariat, UNEA, among others. We consider there is added value um, in the efforts to strengthening policy coherence, uh, assessing needs for capacity building and technical assistance, as well as identifying the scope of, of the collective approaches we were talking about. Uh, finally, uh, as you know, UNEA 5.2 is coming soon and we have a big opportunity there to act and to stop the plastic pollution. We strongly support uh, the establishment of an intergovernmental negotiating committee on marine litter and plastic pollution to develop international instruments to prevent uh, the combat and combat uh, plastic waste pollution, um, the, the draft resolution that was presented by Peru. Uh, this complex problem needs innovative and comprehensive solutions with a human rights approach. Gaps and barriers must be addressed. Um, existing instruments and initiatives should be strengthened. A coherence, coordination and synergies among um, multilateral environmental agreements and other frameworks are needed for a better use of the resources and to achieve more effective results. There is also a need to promote a circular economy strategies and innovation as, as also as Brenda mentioned previously, with an economic approach. We need to identify business opportunities and economic benefits. We need to involve the industry to improve technologies and processes from the design stage and throughout the life cycle of plastics. It is fundamental for us to engage with the private and financial sector, the civil society, the academy, and the scientific community. There are many pieces of this puzzle that need to be aligned with a core international legally binding agreement. Thank you very much. Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, uh... That was great. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm busy typing notes, so I was not quite um, swiftly prepared to take back the floor. But thank you so much. Um, there are many things I appreciated about um, what you said, but the, I think the key thing that you have really underlined is that there are many uh, pieces of this puzzle and they can move in parallel. What we need to do is to get um, governments at the national level thinking and stakeholders working together to solve this. And we can push that, you know, some processes will be slower, some may move faster, but what, what we need is the, is the, the action and the reflection, um, especially at, at the national level. It was also really uh, useful, I think, for you to um, underline the importance of the Basel Convention, which we haven't had so much time to talk about um, today, your emphasis on fully implementing that and continuing to elaborate um, that process. Um, and also, I, I do think that um, your point about the economics of this is really important, that we need to, you know, this is a huge shift that we're talking about of a huge global industry that many countries, including developing countries, have a stake in. And so we will need to involve um, uh, industry and others to look at how we provide incentives to shift um, and, 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 and where we can find new opportunities for countries in other industries that may emerge as well. So um, with that, I'll turn back to Andres because we wanted to start, we have 15 or so minutes for Q&A, but um, as CL is also a co-host of this, I really wanted to turn to him um, to, to sort of uh, sum up a little where he sees some of the next steps um, and actions um, going forward, um, having heard all of your presentations. So Andres, I'll hand the floor back to you and then I'll, I'll meanwhile look for some more questions. Thank you, Andres. Thank you so much, Caroline. And I was trying to look at my notes and saying, why can I highlight from this uh, really substantive uh, presentation from each of the panelists that uh, I don't want to repeat what was had said, but some of the call for action from all the from all of the panelists. The first is that we are clear that we're talking about a life cycle approach for and a cooperative and co coherence approach that we need to to use to solve this uh, ground, the difficult and uh, complex uh, 
crisis, having into account that the crisis is not only complex, but urgent. So we need to act now. We don't need to delay to see if a tree, a tree will save us from where we are now. But also we need a legal framework. And uh, because at the end of the day, some of the, the legal features can't help uh, communities in the ground to, to rely on that and, and make sure that, uh, that uh, they get environmental justice. For instance, Hemanta was, her, was sharing how from the production and transport of uh, noodles and pellets to the waste uh, shipment of illegal waste shipment of plastic, there is a problem. So it's, life cycle. it's a life cycle problem. We need life cycle solutions too. Then uh, that is cross-cutting issue is not only trade related, but also uh, environmental climate, uh, human rights and, and health related too. Then the, from Brenda, we really saw a really good summary of the discussion. It's of the discussion, how is going on at the, at the UNEP and the UNEA uh, arena too, and the different fora and how UNEP is already taking a step to work and to, to make this kind of shift of paradigm that is necessary. And the call for action is like, we need to keep doing what, uh, and to escalate what we are doing now, if we want to have an impact to prevent a catastrophe. Then uh, from Maria Daniela, this is really interesting to have, and we're really happy to have uh, Ecuador uh, here on board with us, because Ecuador has been pivotal as a champion states uh, on the issue of plastics, we can them we can see them in different in, in different arenas, not only in, at UNEP, not only as co-sponsor, but also co-organizers, co-chairs, and uh, this is really impressive. And we we commend them to continue this uh, this virtuosity. So, um, and the IDP and the uh, specifically the the joint statement, we know that. Perhaps the negative side is we don't, we're not having an MC12 here, but perhaps that helps uh, us to gather more mem more members that will uh, that will support this uh, joint statement on plastic pollution at the WTO side too, and also uh, coherence and, and cooperative approach are necessary. From Valentina, we uh, saw a specific example of how uh, government being involved behind some of the major achievements and how uh, was really important the adoption of the of the three plastic amendments at the Basel Convention because that is also giving a sprint to the to the solutions that are proposed over the counter. So and uh, I won't say what I, I won't repeat what I already said in my presentation, but trade related measures uh, within the treaty will be more than necessary. Thank you so much, Caroline. Back to you. Great, um, thank you very much, Andres. And one thing that I'd really like to do, um, go back to after um, this event is, is your slide, because I, I thought what was really interesting, or what was really challenging in this field is that our understanding of the plastic crisis is evolving very fast. Over the last year and a half, you know, the framing of the issue and the understanding of the evidence is, is still evolving. And there's so many different statements from different kinds of international organizations and processes and regional bodies. And I think it's really important to do what you have done to sort of build those together to really show where the cutting edge is on, on, on where governments, what governments have already come to understandings of, um, especially around the description of the plastics problem and where the need for action lies. I think the reason that's so important is when we're talking about the trade issues, especially among trade negotiators who may not be expert on environment issues, we really need to make sure that this work is grounded in the latest environment evidence and what environmental policymakers are telling us about, you know, what kind of solutions will work or not work and where are various pitfalls. Um, so I think from that point of view, it really underlines this case for having a wider uh, framework um, in terms of the, you know, a global treaty that can really help set out where our, our goals and targets and, and kind of top priorities and where do the solutions lie. And then we can fit some of these um, economic instruments and others to help achieve those goals. But, but what we really need is to, is to draw together that consensus around what the, what the goals are. Um, that's at least a, a view from me. But I do have two questions here and I'm hoping that Hamanta, you may be able to help us uh, with two of them. One was around um, whether there's a scope for addressing some of these issues around um, plastic nurdles and the loss of um, plastics at sea in the context of the global treaty 
or where you see that, that being addressed. And there was also a question from someone about the EU, uh, I'm just looking for it, uh, the EU's, um, sorry, uh, waste shipment agreement. Um, and there was a, a, a question of whether you've studied that EU waste shipment agreement and whether there are any points that, um, that could be um, improved in that in regard to plastic waste. But Hemanta, I hand the floor to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Caroline. Uh, it was uh, very nice to hear a um, lot of uh, very important presentations by all the speakers. Um, I think uh, the issue about plastic noodles, uh, which is a very clear example of how we need, we really need to have a very strong regulation um, uh, when when they're transporting um, the plastic noodles, and also the waste case we we are handling. I think it was um, as as Andre mentioned, this is a life cycle issue. I think if you if you don't use this example to convince the international bodies, I think this is going to be a failure of the civil society. Um, I, I think all the governments, all the governments, all the bodies should should get together to use this example. And we are talking about 1,680 metric tons of plastic noodles taking uh, transporting on the deck of a ship. Um, so um, it is. It was just on the on the plastic bags, and when they fell into the ocean, they broke. And and about two meter high plastic noodles came into the beaches in Sri Lanka, and almost seven hundred kilometers of beaches were, were were contaminated with plastics. With about forty percent, still there are some plastics uh, inside the ocean, and and now they have spread to uh, I, I think maybe about 10, 12 countries already. Unless we use this as an example, because there was a previous issue about uh, one incident in Hong Kong, one incident in Durban, uh, maybe one or two other countries. But this is the 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 biggest issue. I think we have to take this to every level uh, to to demand for a for a global treaty um, to to declare this as the hazardous uh, material uh, because these plastics ca can bind with uh, dioxins, furans, PCBs, um, which are carcinogenic, and they can transfer into the bodies of the of the fish. Um, and then comes back to the human life. And so we don't know. And, and those plastics will be there for next 500, 1000 years. Unless we use this example, I think it's going to be our failure. Um, so I think we should we should we should continue to push this to all the all the international bodies. I think that I hope the IMO also will, will take this issue seriously. And, and during the plastic treaty, definitely, yes. Um, I'm not sure about the other other European waste treaty. Perhaps uh, somebody else can help me. Great, thank you very much, Hamanta. Um, uh, sorry, uh, Andres, did you want to take up the question about the EU waste shipment? Yes, thank you. So as uh, some of you may know, there is a new proposal for uh, the review of the regulation called waste shipment regulation at the European Union level that will need to have, a, a, that there is a proposal that was tabled two weeks ago by the uh, EU Commission and to, now there is a legislative procedure that will take at least the next uh, eight months to discuss and then come up with a, a specific and robust uh, uh, waste shipment regulation uh, update, updated to uh, not only the scope of, of plastics but also different scopes and it's worth to say that also the Basel Convention is not only about plastics, it's co it covers also different uh, kind of uh, substances. So on that regard, there are some uh, commonalities to look at there too. And of the operation of recycling or, you know, what is the purpose of exporting or importing something is for, for recycling operation, for disposal operation or for recovery operation. And those kind of subtleties need to be addressed and open into the scope of the European Union at some point to, to, to harmonize with what the Basel said. Great, excellent, thank you very much. I just wanted to hand back, I think, to others on the, um, on the panel, if there were reflections that you had, um, Daniela or Valentina on the, on the presentations of others is where you see um, critical sort of next steps um, or opportunities that could be seized. Daniela? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Caroline, and thank you for the presentation, uh, Andres uh, and Valentina. And um, two things. Um, I think there's um, 
Andres, your presentation was excellent. I think uh, we need to, to, to present that in the IDP because um, what we have mentioned here is that uh, we need um, we need to enhance this uh, cooperation and, and this collective approach. And you mentioned that if we want to make an impact, we certainly need to escalate things. And one thing we need to work on is how, for example, members in the IDP can support the Peruvian and Rwanda resolution. And we need all of us together in this different um, area. So, so first, an invitation to, to, to for, for your contribution, certainly. Um, uh, from the Ecuadorian side in, in, in the IDP would be really welcome. I, it was a great presentation. And also, uh, Valentina mentioned one very important thing, the importance, and Caroline, you also said, the, what we're doing here internationally, we need to do uh, domestically. So being able to sit down with ministers of environment, trade, finance, um, and, and, and all together to, to come with uh, a solution. Um, and, and to, to, to really make an impact, to really come with actions. Uh, and Valentina mentioned one very important thing, uh, by the way, uh, how they work together, environment and trade officials, that's a very important thing. So, so it's just to encourage uh, more of these encounters between um, the, the, the trade community and the random mental community and uh, stakeholders have been key to do this. I mean, if it weren't for Caroline or for Andres, we wouldn't be here sitting uh, together and, and coming with creative views. Uh, so so my, my, I didn't have anything to say, but uh, thank you to all, uh, because it has been a very important conversation and, and we need to keep working and, and certainly escalate things to, to come um, to have an impact. Thank you so much, Daniela. So I'm gonna to turn to Valentina and also to you, Brenda, as well. Uh, Valentina. Thank you, Caroline. Yes, I think that the well, one of the main messages that that stayed with me um, is this importance of, of of having more coherence and and to talk to each other and to develop uh, synergies together, and not only with different governments and, and international organizations, but also with all the stakeholders. Uh, well, all this is a clear example of what we have here in this panel, uh, but also it's, it's very important to, to include the, the private sector, the finance sector, um, the scientific community, uh, all stakeholders uh, will play a major role uh, to stop uh, plastic pollution. And also I think one of the, the umbrellas of, of all the processes and, and one of the main um, main needs that we have and, and, and it's how we will achieve good results is if we have political will. So I think that that's one of the main, main messages that I want to, to leave here, that we need political will. And, and with, with all the, the support of the diverse stakeholders, with the media, with the youth, with or the civil society, with all these movements, uh, we have more visibility, we, we create consciousness. So it's very important uh, the role of any of these stakeholders for this agreement to happen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Valentina. And Brenda from UNEP. Sure, thank you very much, Carolyn. And thanks to CIL and the organizers for the event. It's been a real pleasure. Um, I think I just want to emphasize as closing that you know we really need all actors on board because it's a, such a complex issue and so um, you know we really welcome the cooperation here and in other bubbles uh, also in terms of um, health um, um, maritime issues etc and so bringing all of these um, players together is super important and we're really grateful for you know this in-depth analysis um, you know Andreas thank you so much because I think it's a very well connected piece. Um, and, and as Valentina and, and Daniela both emphasized, taking these issues back home and working at the national level is also where we're going to find the solutions and where we're going to actually drive the change. Um, so I just wanted to emphasize, you know, the important role of all actors and my key message as I ended was, you know, together we'll make the difference. And I think that's just critical for us in moving forward that together we'll have the solutions. So thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Brenda. So I have just a minute or two to wrap up. I think that we have achieved our goal today of um, exploring how trade and trade policy are relevant um, to international efforts um, to tackle plastic pollution. Our speakers have provided a really excellent overview of the state of play, um, the challenges at hand, 
where more attention is needed and where we need to take action. We've heard a call to push forward with the Global Treaty on Plastic Pollution, to strengthen implementation of the Basel Convention, to move out ahead with our work to understand and boost cooperation on trade dimensions of plastic pollution across the life cycle, and also to harness opportunities wherever they arise at the WTO, in the UNEA process, at the IMO, um, and also we haven't had them here today, but also at UNCTAD is doing some really important work on trade and plastic pollution with particular um, focus on developing countries in that, um, on that issue. And I think our speakers have each also underlined um, the urgency of the challenge at hand and also the need to listen to evidence and experience from stakeholders working on the ground at the front line to do work um, and that excellent work that Hemanta has been doing. Um, we need this in order to act and we need to find ways to ensure that this kind of evidence and data is present in the minds of policymakers as they grapple with these issues so that it doesn't seem remote, so they have a sense of this, of, of this urgency. And we really need to find ways to ensure that we're using the best available evidence so that policies are credible and also effective. Um, one of the issues we haven't dealt with so much today, but was hinted at, especially by Valentina, is that we need to understand the challenges of transforming such a huge sector in our global economy and finding pathways to transition away from unsustainable production and use of plastics. So here, economic policies are going to be really vital. Of course, trade policies are part of it, but so is finance and investment and insurance policies that underpin the status quo, and that will all need to be part of incentivizing a shift um, to much greater sustainability. There was one question that we had that we didn't get to, which was around um, carbon, the carbon content of trade and how climate policies are could be relevant. So I just wanted to flag that here that, of course, there are multiple different um, policy um, instruments that can, be, that can be used and are relevant here. But just to, very, to close very quickly, I think a really positive note is in my experience over 20, 25 years of following environment and trade issues, what we've always been missing is the isolation of trade policymakers from environmental realities and priorities. And I think here we're really seeing a really massive shift um, from both from the point of view of this panel and the governments involved, a willingness to connect the dots. And we should really, really embrace this um, uh, as, as what we, you know, as the way, as the way forward. Um, connecting the dots and promoting efforts that are joined up across international processes um, and, and, and the constituencies at hand. Um, there are really powerful vested interests and strong economic um, reasons for countries not to shift in this area. And so we really need a constellation of stakeholders to help find ways forward on this. So with that, on behalf of CL and, TS, uh, and TESS, I'd like to thank our excellent set of speakers this morning for your cooperation and your collaboration. I'd like to thank Eleanor from CL for doing so much of the work behind the scenes and Mahesh in pulling this event together. And for our colleagues at IASD for their impressive trade and sustainability hub and for giving us the opportunity to host this session today. So thank you all very, very much. <laughs>